Immediately after the end of the First World War, aircraft manufacturers across Europe were scrambling to adjust to the new market of civil aviation. Many companies folded during this turbulent time, either due to excessive wartime surplus taxes, or simply being too reliant on military contracts, which were now being slashed left, right and centre. In Britain, the period between 1918 and 1922 saw the untimely end of several notable manufacturers, but it also saw the emergence of new companies, some of whom would rapidly become household names in the field of aviation. When Airco was compelled to close its doors in 1920, one of its top designers, Geoffrey de Havilland, decided to strike out and start his own business. He made the decision to focus most of the company's early efforts on building civil designs, a decision that would pay off. By focusing on the small but rapidly emerging civil market, de Havilland secured itself a future during a time that saw many other companies close their doors for good. And the plane that started it all was the little-known DH-29 Doncaster. Unlike many of de Havilland's later designs, this was not a success, but it nonetheless is still important for laying the groundwork of the company's future, as well as being the first British aircraft built with a thick section cantilever wing. De Havilland had begun experimentation with a design that was known as the DH-26, for which, sadly, no surviving drawings or photos seem to exist. The emerging civil aircraft market was already proving to be a highly competitive field, and de Havilland was looking for something new that would give his designs a decided advantage. He knew that one of the biggest areas for improvement would be efficiency, as the cost per mile in both fuel and power was already a hugely influential factor, and so he decided to do away with the drag-inducing, wire-braced biplane design and to try a thick-profile monoplane instead. This attracted the attention of the Air Ministry, who then ordered a larger design for research as a potential long-range transport, and thus the DH-29 Doncaster was born. The Doncaster took some of its design features from the DH-18, which was the last aircraft designed by de Havilland during his time with Airco and the two aircraft would share the same shock absorbers, cooling system, and fuselage structure. Like on the DH-18, the Doncaster structure was primarily built from wood. The fuselage was built around spruce longerons, and to keep the main cabin free from obstructions, a series of cross struts was employed. This not only kept the cabin space free of internal bracing, but also served as a suitable mounting point for the undercarriage. Aside from also having an identical engine, the 450 horsepower Napier Lion, this is where the similarities end with the DH-18. The tail services, though similar in appearance, were in fact built to their own design, and the wing of course was de Havilland's new thick profile monoplane design. Like the main structure, the wing was also built mainly from wood, with the main service covered in fabric. In its original configuration, it was fitted with differential ailerons, and also contained a pair of fuel tanks on the leading edge. Due to the high placement of the wing, this fuel could be gravity-fed into the engine without the need for pumps, which helped keep the design simple. The prototype Doncaster was flown for the first time on July 5th, 1921, with de Havilland at the controls. Unfortunately, he had quite the rough time of it. Firstly, the placement of the engine, the size of the propeller, and the location of the open cockpit lined up in such a way that de Havilland's face received the strongest winds possible during flight. This also caused damage to some of the doped panels immediately adjacent to the cockpit, which in turn disturbed the airflow over the central section of the wing and affected performance. Landing went just as poorly, when the ineffectiveness of the rudder became immediately apparent as the prototype entered an uncontrollable ground loop during landing, drawing a lovely circle on the airstrip. In a vain attempt to improve directional control, a new nose was built to raise the engine up by 20 inches, but this caused problems with the gravity-fed fuel system. A low-pressure fuel system was then installed, and this necessitated the addition of a streamlined header tank on top of the centre section of the wing. 
The elevators were also changed out for horn balance units, and it was in this guise that the aircraft went to Martlesham in 1922 for its initial trials. During this time, it was modified again, with a series of portholes replacing the old sliding windows, and a gunner's cockpit was installed with a scarf ring. It then, at some point between 1922 and 1924, received the name of Doncaster, and this model was then used at RAE Farnborough for a series of control tests to collect data on the performance of the thick profile wing. Before the first prototype had even flown, a second Doncaster was built, this time as a purely commercial aircraft as de Havilland had originally intended. Ten wicker chairs were installed in the fuselage, with a gangway running down the middle, and a door at the front of the cabin gave access to the cockpit, the pilots on the original Doncaster having been forced to use a ladder to get into the plane. In its commercial form, the Doncaster provided the promise of success that de Havilland had hoped for. Even though it was powered by the same engine as the DH-18 biplane, it could carry a heavier load over a longer distance whilst using less fuel. Further modifications then raised the Doncaster's passenger capacity to 12, which may not sound like much today, but for a single-engine aircraft in 1922, this was a solid achievement. Unfortunately, the Doncaster was to be a victim of its own design. Though it had attracted interest from several companies, other control problems had come to light which were not fully understood at the time concerning the new wing, and addressing them would also take time. It was also still plagued with the habit of wanting to ground loop during landing. Though modifications could no doubt have been made to improve things, the need for new aircraft in the civil industry was so urgent that several companies placed orders with de Havilland for the DH-34 instead, which was essentially a biplane that took the best features of the Doncaster into a more stable package. In consequence of this, the Doncaster's chance of civil service was gone. Its only recorded public appearance was at the Imperial Air Conference in February of 1922, where it featured as a purely static exhibit, and in the following November it joined the first prototype at Martlesham Heath. Here, they both went through a considerable program of test flights, and these made a considerable contribution to the understanding of the behaviour of thick-section cantilever wings. That being said, the Doncaster had shown to Havilland that further development work on monoplane designs was needed before they became a viable commercial option, and monoplane de Havillands would not take to the skies again until the latter years of the 1920s. The Doncaster's direct successor, the DH-34, enjoyed a little more success. The prototype flew for the first time in March of 1922, and, as a testament to the urgent need for transports, it was entered into passenger service just over a week later. The first plane was quickly followed by an order for seven more, and, carrying up to ten passengers, the DH-34s were used heavily on the cross-channel air routes, with the fleet completing more than 8,000 hours in their first nine months of operations. They made a striking impression, and claimed several records in the civil industry, including being the first civil transport to complete multiple channel crossings in a single day. By June of 1922, DH-34s were completing five of these trips in a single day, and they were now also flying services between England and Germany. When Imperial Airways was formed in 1924, it inherited seven DH-34s from former operators, and kept them in regular service. Their time in this role was brief, as they were replaced with multi-engine aircraft in the spring of 1926, but their exceptional reliability and longevity, with one model logging over 130,000 miles, helped de Havilland to establish an early and excellent reputation in the industry, one that would secure its future throughout the rest of the 1930s and the 1940s. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the patrons, with a special shout out to Kevin, Deliado, Bain, FB, Christopher R., Tronathon, Eric Hindman, John Austin Jr., Ray Carlotta, Keith Tarrier, Green Sea Ships, Northlinks Web, and MCT, and Ted Parsons, nearly forgot you, for their support as Wing Commander tier patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.